Ruiz. Welcome to another edition of Truth and Rhythm, brought to you by FunkinStuff.net. This is the interview show that gets deep in the pocket with contemporary music's foremost masters of the groove. I am your host, Scott Dr. GX Wolfine, musicologist, creative arts journalist, and multimedia pro. Whether you're watching the video version of this show or the audio-only podcast version, I thank you so much for your continued interest and support in this show. If you enjoy this programming, there are several ways to help support Truth and Rhythm, as well as contribute to further enhancements and expansion, plus get some sweet perks and rewards in the process. First, subscribe to the Funkin' Stuff channel on YouTube, which is where Truth and Rhythm lives, and be an advocate by spreading the word among fellow funk, jazz, and R&B music lovers. Second, join Truth and Rhythm's new membership program through Patreon, which features three tiers for truth believers, truth seekers, and truth crusaders. You can also submit a direct donation to the cause anytime at funkinstuff.net. At that site, which is loaded with awesome content, you can also purchase the book, Everything's on the One, The First Guide of Funk. Shop for official Truth and Rhythm and Funk and Stuff merchandise and use the Amazon links for all of your online purchases, which allocates a percentage to this show. Sponsorship opportunities are available as well. Contact me directly at scottg at funkinstuff.net. For those of you who go the extra step in supporting the show, you have my heartfelt gratitude for allowing us to continue to shine the light on those special artists whose quest is to find truth in rhythm. It's a pleasure to welcome to the Truth and Rhythm Mothership, Stuart Gray who has spent decades traveling the world as a touring road and production manager for dozens of high-profile funk, R&B, and hip-hop acts, having worked especially closely with the Commodores. Other artists include Rick James, Tina Marie, Cameo, the Barcaves, the Fatback Band, Slave, the OJ's Maze, the Ohio Players, and Confunction. He's here to share his unique vantage point, perspective, uh, perspectives, and stories. Stuart, thanks for joining the show. How are you? Well, how are you doing, Scott? Thanks for having me. My um, pleasure, man. I've been waiting to, you know, uh, let loose a little bit on uh, this funk music. Uh, yeah. Where are you today? I'm in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, GA. All right. Well, certainly a lot of funk there. Uh-huh. <laughs> and where are you from originally? Harlem, USA. Well, The world's most famous neighborhood. Yeah. So, uh, did you spend many times going to the Apollo? I that's where my career started. Um, back in the early seventies, the uh, contract for doing the Apollo was a four day run, Thursday through Sunday, with two shows on Saturday. I believe it was two shows on Saturday, right? Early show and a late show on Saturday. So um, my job working with the Commodores was to stand behind the curtain on top of a fog machine and lower down the dry ice on cue. And the reason I had to stand on top of the machine because the water was so hot that sometimes the stuff would overflow. But um, that was uh, my first job behind the scenes at the Apollo Theater for the four day run of the Commodores. Uh, my godfather uh, managed the Commodores. Uh, his name was Benjamin Ashburn. And he was a liquor wholesaler for different companies working in Harlem. So um, he had, uh, you know, um, personal um, connections to Cotton Club, uh, all of the clubs in Harlem. 
And one of the clubs was Walt Chamberlain's, Wilt, Wilt Chamberlain's Smalls Paradise, which was actually right up the street on 135th Street from where my godfather uh, lived on, in Lenox Terrace, which was right across the street from Harlem Hospital, where I was born, on 135th Street. So um, the story um, goes as the Commodores came from Tuskegee, Alabama, as college freshmen. They uh, joined together, uh, you know, find out. Uh, I think that the story is um, three of the guys wanted to be in a group, and the other three guys had equipment. So this is one of the guys, the, the three guys that had equipment. So they decided to join people who had equipment and that kind of started them off. So they, they drove up uh, kind of unannounced uh, to Walt, Will Chamberlain's club and they stunk up the place. You know, they, it was just, I wasn't there, but uh, they stunk up the place. So, but my godfather, uh, Benny uh, took a liking and, and you know, they kind of, had a conversation, I guess. And he just put it out there. Well, if you come back to New York, come and see. Which, you know, back in the days was like rolling dice, crapshoot, you know. And uh, I think uh, three months later, they knocked on his door. So he was kind of surprised, but that's what it takes to, you know, uh, live your dream. So they, uh, they came back to New York and went, when they went back to Wilkes' place, they blew the house down. Choreography, showmanship, musicianship, dance routines, songs of the, you know, songs of their generation of that era before they even made a record. So I would imagine it was mostly cover tunes. And uh, that uh, intrigued my godfather. So he decided to take them on as clients. And the first stop was Barry Gordy's office at Motown, straight did, to Motown. Did, did Benny know Barry? Uh, I don't think he knew him personally, but um, he didn't want to go straight to that company. And um, the rest is kind of history. And um, then their first engagement, uh, I think they opened up for the Jackson Five. I actually went to that show at Madison Square Garden, took a picture with the Jackson Five in the dressing room, uh, had a girl over my house and she stole a picture. <laughs> you know, I just wasn't security. You know, okay, yeah, see the picture. Da -da -da. Michael Jackson's in the picture. Tito, you know, they took a, Nice little shot. I went, I, he, my godfather um, had a good relationship with Joseph Jackson, and they let me in the dressing room before the show. They were all dressed and kind of just huddling together. And I said, hey, man, took around and took a picture. And um, I, I, I wonder where that picture is now. <laughs> were, were, you, were you already, like, were you very into music, or did that help get you into music? In 19, well, growing up in Harlem, uh, there was, the AM radio station, uh, WLIB, WWRL. And um, what I do remember about that station is they had a top 10 list every week. And in my growing up, at least three or four songs out of that top 10 were all James Brown records. He dominated the charts. He put out, he was a record machine put out records and records and records. So it was kind of, excuse me, intriguing that, you know, no matter who else was, he had three or four records on that list every week. So um, then in 1964, I saw the Beatles on TV. And that led me to, um, bring home coffee cans to my house and play uh, fake drums with pencils. I had pencils. 
I, you know, had fake symbols and I just started learning how to listen to music. And that's where I started listening to music. So the Beatles were one of my favorite, still one of my all time favorite groups there. Creativity, the, the sounds, the beats, you know. And um, uh, lo and behold, the uh, original drummer, uh, I, I saw your interview with Ronald Lepre, and there was original drummer before Clyde, and he got drafted to the army. My godfather gave me the drum kit that he left behind. Him knowing, you know, just knowing that I love music, and he gave me the drum kit. So I had this professional drum kit, didn't know how to, and then brought it to my house. I, I lived on the, the top floor, six story building in Harlem, uh, uptown. And my mother said, get that drum kit out of my house. It's making, and I took it on my roof and started playing. And then everybody heard and then started coming up, congregating on my roof. Then the ceiling on my house started cracking. <laughs> and my mother said, get the drums off the because we lived on the top floor. So the weight, everybody bounced to the beat. Now my ceiling started cracking. Um, I got into some, you know, high school groups, uh, uh, listening to, I, I was a, I could play listening to anything, basically. Um, you know, I, I noticed that young people have that kind of um, uh, uh, magnet for talent. You know, you, you, you hear something, I didn't know how to read, but I played all of the James Brown, you know, parts and, I played all of the songs that I that I learned how to uh, love, and got into some bands early in my you know early in high school, and then the bass player's mother would come and say, "My son's not going to be a musician," and take him out the group. So then we'd have to find another player, you know, beat him up. Da -da 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 -da. Then the guitar player's mother, ah, my son's not going to be a musician. So. I kind of gave up on the drums, you know, I kind of, I wasn't, my ego wasn't, I could play. And then my father uh, took me to um, a clinic in Harlem, Earl Hines, famous jazz drummer. And I, uh, when I went into the room, I kind of, you know, in my neighborhood, I was this big. But when I went to that room and saw other people drumming, I knew that, wow, I'm not even ready yet. You know, they were doing paradiddles and doing all kinds of things. I was like, whoa, hey, you know, and I got a little intimidated because it was a shock to me. And I, but then, um, um, did some more stuff. Uh, the first uh, job I went to do with the Commodores after the Apollo. Um, I was home in Queens. I had moved to Queens by that time. And um, I went, uh, did the Apollo shows. And then I went home and started playing around. And then the next weekend, my godfather called me on the Friday and said, where are you supposed to be on the flight? What, you, you got a job. <laughs> you supposed to be on a flight, you know? So he said, yeah, you know, what, what's wrong with you? You know, you, what are you thinking here? So I, I didn't know I, Nobody, nobody. You missed the memo. Nobody told me that this was a job because every job application that I filled out, there was no category for musician. There was no category for entertainment, you know. So I actually got a job. My mother, my mother got a job for me on the, at on 125th Street, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the Social Security Administration. I was a mailroom G1. And my godfather pulled me out of that job and sent me down to Tuskegee. The first spot I ever went to down south was Tuskegee, Alabama. How old were you at that point? Uh, probably 15 or 14 years old. And uh, 
I went, uh, you know, and I was the boss's kid, basically. My father was a city bus driver in New York City, and uh, my godfather took me down to uh, Tuskegee. And I never forget, I played basketball. I was a very good athlete. You know, I was really quick and quick thinking. And I, you know, played basketball a lot. Harlem is, you know, basketball and Harlem go together. And I never forget, um, I went to the park one day and dusted off, dusted off some kids in the park. You know, they were like, oh, I was doing all kinds of things. Yeah. So one of the kids came over to me after the game. I was sitting, he said, oh, you're not from around here, are you? I said, no. How could you tell? Was it my, you know, jump shot? Was it my layup? He said, no. You got black dirt on your shoes. Dirt down here is red. Oh, I was like, wait, wait. And just like that, an old country twang, he said, dirt down here is red. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did some, and then my godfather uh, managed two other groups, Platinum Hook and another girl group from Detroit called Three Ounces of Love. Mm -hmm. So at that point, uh, my godfather put me in charge of Platinum Hook. I was their truck driver, their sound engineer, their setup guy, breakdown guy, and then drive the truck to the next show. So you're at least 16 by then, right? S at least I was 16 or 17, yeah. Yep. Probably 18 when I had my driver's license, yeah. So Platinum Hook recorded an album. And Platinum Hook was the house band at a at a favorite music spot in New York called The Cellar, The Cellar Restaurant, run by Howard and Brad Johnson. Platinum Hook, they had entertainment, uh, three, three shows per night, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, three sets per night. So in How The long, Cellar- what, Like an hour each set or something? Hour, hour each set and an hour in between. So we ran from 10 to two in the morning. Hour set, hour in between, hour set, hour in between, hour set. Um, Platinum Hook, uh, their famous song was, uh, get, they did the cover of Standing on the Verge of Getting It On. And they were very talented from East Orange, from Oranges in New Jersey. Um, they have one album out. Um, and then um, on the tour, uh, one of my godfather's uh, friends was Clarence Jones. He was a promoter, along with Quentin Perry, Taurus Productions out of Detroit. Clarence lived in Huntsville, Alabama. Clarence managed Confunction. And he saw me you know, taking charge and doing stuff. And he pulled me to the side and said, hey, man, you want to get a, I got this group out here in California and I want you to be, I want you to come work for me. So um, I went to, to California, first time ever in California. He rented me a car. Um, I think it was a Lincoln or something because Felton, the, uh, trombone and lead singer had hurt his neck and was in a neck brace for like three weeks. And he was staying at the Hyatt uh, on Sunset, which was a, at that time a rock and roll hotel. And uh, he said, listen, all I want you to do is take Felton around. He's probably not going to be moving around too much, too fast, but wherever he needs to go, just stick with it. Here's a car. Here's a map how to get to the hotel. Never, driv never drove in California before and started working now as a drum tech for a confunction. Was that before they had their Mercury Records deal or were they already doing that? They already were into fun and uh, their first album. And um, I uh, stayed with them at the uh, Travel Lodge in Vallejo, California. Um, they put us up for rehearsals and every time we came back, that's where our base was. 
Did, did you get to see them rehearse? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what were they like then? You know, because, uh, I mean, that first record that had fun also had Can Functionize You, which is one of my favorites. Functionize You, fun, yes. Yeah. They were, they had, they, and, and, and lo and behold, their producer was Skip Scarborough, who also did um, the comedy. Oh, yeah, and Earth, Wind, and Fire, all kinds James, of people. Uh, yep, yep. So they just had that, you know, music, music industry, you know, we're connected like that. So um, we did a bunch of festivals, a bunch of shows, the uh, Circle Star Theater in uh, Oakland. And ran around the country opening up for um, Cool and the Gang and, you know, all of these funk festivals. And Sheila E. was the percussionist. There's a famous picture. Right. With yeah, Sheila E. Before George Duke, even. Before mm -hmm. George Duke. I used to carry Sheila E. on my back from the dressing room to the stage. She was, you know, just awesome, sexy. What could you say? Mm -hmm. um, so from then on, uh, you know, I uh, worked for Slave. What uh, what era of Slave? They had so many different personnel changes over the years. This was right when Steve Arrington broke off from Steve Washington. I never met Steve Washington. I, I was dying to meet him because he was the little genius master cylinder head behind. Fearless his, leader, uh, yeah. The, right, and the fearless leader, and I think there were like 19 people in the group. So uh, the Steve Arrington part of Slave, with, uh, I got with, I got with Slave right after Slide, and uh, I mixed their front of house. I did, I used to, uh, when 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 I lived in Harlem, we used to have block parties all the time, and I was always into technical stuff. I was always watching the technical guy, you know, who was playing the record and how the turntable would da da da. And I had an ear for instruments, so I could mix, you know, a rec. I can mix a a a, a, a song live and reproduce it to what I heard on the record. A little bit more guitar here, a little bit more drums here. Um, and that was my strength, my ears. When I worked at the cellar restaurant, I was the house sound engineer for two years, no matter who came in the room. And that's what I liked about not being a musician. Um, I could be in a club, work, and whoever the talent was, I was always in the room. And that was exciting for me, no matter who came through. So in the cellar restaurant, Melissa Morgan, Najee, Whitney Houston used to come. Uh, Stevie Wonder would come after playing the garden. He would come to the cellar to hang out and jam. And that was in the, we're still in the 70s? Yes. Yeah. And it was that kind of a club with that kind of a, a, a prestige, um, artists that had bigger gigs around the city came and let loose and relaxed at the cellar. And it was also a spot where we had the first open mic without being called because one of the rules of a cellar, if you were, if you were a musician or a singer and you showed up at the cellar, you were getting called on stage. The band knew everybody. So um, I saw Johnny Kemp. Johnny Kemp became a real good friend of mine. He was in a band and then came to the cellar and did his thing. And, and Johnny Kemp, I mixed him. And it was just so much fun and exciting and safe. And uh, women, wine and song. and Good times. <laughs> yeah, man, you know, the, the, and, and, it's, and doing that many shows at the cellar was like boot camp. So um, I'm going to, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I might at no, times. So. 
Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, to, just to grab some some stuff. Um, yeah. So with Slave, did you get to meet um, Mark Adams and Mark Hicks? Oh, and that was the group. Steve Arrington, Mark Adams, uh, Drac, Danny Webster, um, uh, Roger Parker on drums, uh, and then Floyd Miller, and a couple of side guys, uh, Delbert Taylor. He was, was a vocalist. Starlina still there? Or? Now, this was right after Starlina. Um, Starlina had... Done her aura thing? Right. She had, we had... Because Kurt was part of that slave. And then she broke off with Kurt to do aura. And um, fast forward a little bit. I worked for Johnny Gill when he was 16. And we actually did a show with Starlina in D.C., but I never met her before. I met her, you know, after that. She married J.T. Taylor. Because they were both from Jersey. And her name is, her last name is Young. And her brothers had a group called Young and Company. So, but she's awesome. Starlina was the voice of Slave on, on those slow songs. And she was awesome. But she never was on the road with me. So you got to see them, though, basically in their prime playing like stellar funk, oh, Mark, you know, yes, and things like that. Yes. Stone Jam, Feel My Love, Just a Touch of Love, and then Watching You. This was when Watching You came out on yeah. that Stone Jam album. Yeah, that's like their peak right there. Yes. And um, I we actually were on tour with Roger and Gap Band, and I was started mixing – uh, slave and killing it. They listen. I, I saw your interview with LePred, and um, I believe that Mark Adams was a combination, a uh, 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 heavenly combination hand grenade of Lewis Johnson. Uh, who were the bass players then? I, I got. Larry Graham, saw, Larry Graham, Lewis Johnson, uh, Ron LePred, all these he because every song that Slave recorded started with the rub, yeah. right? And every song that Slave recorded was out of Mark Adams just jamming. All of those riffs, all of those signatures, lines were just Mark making up stuff in his head without pencil and paper. And they came, and then Cedell Carter, Sam Carter were the keyboardists and saxophones. And um, Slave, when I got with Slave, they uh, moved out of Dayton, Ohio, and wanted to move south. So what they did was they just went down 75, in the state 75 south, and we, we landed up in Tampa. So the management moved everybody to Tampa. One, one uh, apartment complex, crew and band under the, under the leadership of Bill Underwood, who uh, again is one of my, you know, one of my heroes because he took me on without knowing really what I did or who I was. And I became the production manager for Slave we uh, opened up for Roger Trotman a lot and Charlie Wilson and the brothers. Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, Slave, for whatever reason, didn't come to the West Coast that much. You know, I didn't get to see them as much as I saw like Roger many times. And um, yeah, it was a little disappointing being in Los Angeles, being a Slave fan. Well, yeah, I remember we did we did some at the uh, LA Convention Center and uh, one, one gig I do remember, um, Bill, uh, uh, what's his name from San Francisco? He managed the Rolling Stone. Bill Graham. Bill Graham. Bill Graham had a funk festival at his spot in Oakland. Parliament, Bootsy, Slave, Rick, all of them. And it was massive. I'll never forget that festival. I had, I'll never forget that festival. It was one of the first funk music, all funk music festivals. And um, Roger, during that tour, uh, 
Roger came to the front of house mixing desk, sat behind me because he wanted to see who this kid was that was out mixing his group and making his ass work harder. And I was, you know, I'm like, Roger, I don't, you saw Roger show where he did a handstand, took his pants off, did a handstand. Yeah. Used to come out. He come out from the back on the shoulders the of, of the roadie. With that yeah. big, huge Texas gallon hat, yep. you know, on the top of the, man, it, the, listen, that is pure funk. And then he got on at the end of his show, he would take his pants down and do a handstand. And that's because the Barcades had a snake, you know, mm. you know what I'm saying? So I really, and then Roger and I, Lester and I, to this day, Roger and I had a friendship. Um, and it all started from him coming to sit behind me to see who this kid was and what was he doing different. And I just mixed the bass, kick, and, the, and Mark Adams was that show. I, I'm so, I'm so thankful that I caught him because he was the combination concentrated of all the funk music, James Brown, uh, Parliament. And the thing about Dayton, Ohio, uh, they were, uh, it was a upper middle class Black community, everybody had jobs. All, all of their families had jobs. And the same thing, they did the same thing on Christmas that we did in Harlem. On Christmas, one year, all of the kids in Dayton got musical instruments. You know, that was the, that was the, the gift of that time, a, a professional bass guitar, drum set, keyboards, horns, whatever. And that led to all of those kids just blowing up and writing music. And um, Mark, uh, Mark was super special. Drac was super special. Danny was super special. Danny and I roomed together a lot. Um, yeah. Cool. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the sounds coming off. Now, Mark had bought Bootsy Collins' old bass rig, which was, he had, it was a stereo bass rig with the, 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 the um, low-end cabinets with two 18-inch woofers in a W cabinet. He used to put sideways. Then we had an Ampeg SVT for the mid-range. He had a 32 band equalizer for each side. It was a massive bass rig. Then on top for the high end, he had the Altec Lansing horns with the 10 inch and three way system, low end, middle, the middle. Now most bass players use the Ampeg SVT for the low end. That was his mid range. And then, and I was, set it up every show and his sound could knock your toes off your shoes man and that rub woo, you know rumble, that yeah that was you know and it was you know it was just so fun and and creative every show we just no matter where we went they were scared of mark adams and drac and danny and Steve Arrington played, now Steve Arrington played the drums. I think, I think, uh, I think actually it's his drumming on, 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 uh, on Sly. Mm, I don't think so. And Steve was into John Coltrane and he could play jazz, uh, you know, switch up. And he was just so, again, mental and, uh, Steve and I to this day still talk. Uh, he and I, you know, talk about great friendship. We used to have ping pong tournaments down in Tampa on our days off, and we used to go to the Gulf of Mexico and fish every day. And yeah, was, Steve, uh, Steve Arrington is so great because he's not only so talented, but also he's a historian of the funk too. 
And uh, yeah, and I and I learned how to mix his vocals with some uh, enhancements, you know, because everybody was trying to critique him because they thought he was off key, right? So they were, what, what's, what's the, you know, but that was his style. And um, we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. No drama, no intimidation. We weren't scared of anybody. And then when Steve left the group, he invited me to come with Hall of Fame. And I actually was in the studio with Steve. Uh, matter, matter of fact, I told you I got a vocal on um, the Showtime album, there's a song called Funkin Town. Mm. And I got a vocal on there. I was just in the studio and the, the producer say, hey, man, just say what you're saying. Go ahead and go in there and say you're, what you You're one of those party people on there? Man, listen, it was, you know, just that kind of community, you know? He said, oh, wait a minute. What? Well, could you just go in there and say what you just said and just have, you know, and be just, you know, and so I, I, you know, and I'm proud of that. You know, I got a vocal on a slave funk music band record in history. That's you cool. know, it, it feels fantastic. That's one of those tracks, too, that um, I definitely hear some of our Ohio players influence, you know, and they were like sort of their big brother group, you know. And um, I know you had some experience with them, too. What, what was the extent of that? Um, their road manager... Uh, I used to work for Ashford and Simpson and um, uh, Diamond and, and the guys had a road manager named James Logan Anderson, rest in peace. And he uh, introduced me to them. <clears throat> and then um, I did some shows. I, I mixed some shows for, for Ohio plays. I never got paid because they were just in that weird zone. So we went on some trips together, not long tours, but I did some great shows. And matter of fact, when they came to New York to play at 42nd Street Park, I mixed there and then I did a show in DC. And um, Diamond, uh, the first show, one of the first shows I mixed for him, he came off the, off the stage sweating. He said, man, this is the first time I ever heard my drums coming from the house. And I had all of the I had all of the bells and whistles, all of the deep tones for the toms and and diamond again, you know, is and he has a big kit too, yeah. Number yeah, number 72 on the on the on the all time, you know, and um and I used to sit in the back of the van with with the Sugarfoot and just say, Sugar man, just talk to me, man. Tell me what it's tell me what it is to be such a maggot brain in this he, he needs to tell me so many stories i sent a picture um when i was doing rick james ohio the last rick james tour with tina ohio plays was the opening act so there's a picture i took a sugarfoot and tina and rick mm. i think i sent you a copy of yeah three greats no longer with us and yeah. after i took that picture Tina came up to me and said, Stu, you never guess what happened. I said, he said, Sugarfoot asked me if he can see my titties. <laughs> That's how. And she said, and I showed them to him. <laughs> 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 And that's that's how maggot brain. Where's, where's that? Where's that picture? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> right? She was, and again, you know, uh, the players, again, you know, it was in their heyday, man. And um, Sugarfoot was special, man. He was just, you know, uninhibited, unabashed funk. You know, you could probably, you could hear and see the maggots coming off of him. And I just wanted to know and just breathe it in and soak it in. Sugar, talk to me, man. He said, man, I, you know, da, da, da. And he loved Larry Blackman and he loved Lionel Richie. And that's where y'all, y'all came from and that. Everybody yeah. copped that, yeah. So uh, we talked music and talked history, man. And, and uh, yeah. So did you get to see them perform in their, you know, like in the- No, not centers? in their, well, I did in New York in the early days. They came to Mount Morris Park uh, to that uh, uh, Quest Love did that documentary. 
Right. But, Summer of uh, Soul, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, I didn't really, you know, I was too young to really, you know, but, um, uh, yeah, but I did see them uh, perform a couple of times and then working for them, you know, it was, and then Diamond used to ask me, you know, he said, well, you know, we're going to come up for an encore. What should I do? I said, hey, dude, who's you you know, just go right to the, you know, go right to the hits, you know, and he used to, and so it was that kind of, that kind of language we had, you know, they did this show and then they used to, then they say, we'll come up for an encore. And I couldn't believe that who she could wasn't in the show. Mm. So he said, well, what should I do for an encore? I said, who she could? That's what I wanted. That's, keep it going. So. Um, and what, what about the Barquets now? The Barquets, again, you know, um, being on the show with Slave, uh, we had a couple of weeks off in Memphis, and I actually stayed at the manager's house or, or one of the guys' houses, the guitar player's house in Memphis. You know, I went to the studio. and that, um, Was that Lloyd Smith? Lloyd Smith, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, spent time in Memphis with them, and... Uh, they were a little bit too too advanced adult wild for me. <laughs> they were yeah, but again, you know, Larry Dotson and and James and now James Alexander and I are still friends to this day. He's uh, definitely a Hall of Famer. You know, deserves everything and all of his 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 blessings. Man, James Alexander is a monster bass player, but he never was a plucker. Never was a hard hitter. He was more of a, you know. And uh, they uh, they had a a, a Gestapo style a Gestapo style tour manager. He used to unplug if we went overtime on a barcade show. He would unplug your amps. <laughs> he would unplug whose amps? Everybody, anybody who opened up for the barcades, if you went overtime uh -huh. on your set. He would start unplugging, turn off the monitor's desk, turn off, turn on the house, get get them all. Yeah. And he was strict. He called him a little Gestapo. I, I, Robert McKissick, never forget his name. He was a little short, dark skinned guy. He had m gun belts on and, and camouflage. And he was military and he took care of the snake and da da da. You know, and the Bark is a big band, Slaves a big band, Ohio plays a big band, Confunction's a big band. So, you know, getting on and off the stage was, you know, always, you know. So he would start pulling out plugs from the amps, take your guitar out, you know, and then scream at you, get the fuck out of <laughs> We had plenty of fights. Um, uh, well, I guess if you saw LaPred, then you know he said the Barquets were that one that it blew him away. Yeah, yeah. They were, again, you know, this was back in the days when, there was a real performance, not just a band on stage. You know, and, I, and I'll give you the philosophy of what I think, where I think funk music and funk bands came from. Uh, you know, before that genre, there was The Temptations, The Four Tops, right? And the band was in the back. They never got introduced. They never got, you know, funk, the, the, funk, um, the funk brothers, you know, along with those traveling musicians. So the migration was, okay, well, the band is playing behind these five vocalists. But in this group, there are also vocalists. So why don't we just move these five vocals and why don't we play and sing as one entity instead of playing behind these guys? We'll come up front. That's where you get funk music for. Yeah, the, and the golden age of the great bands. And they started, you know, everybody wanted to be like Sly. Sly and the Family Stone to this day, I saw I saw Sly and the Family Stone every performance in New York City except for Woodstock. Wow. They were my favorite of all time. I could karaoke all of their songs from top to bottom. The most famous one being Sex Machine on that stand album. And then I saw Sly when he came to Mount Morris Park 
and there was 60,000 people in a park that held 6,000 with no extra amplification, no extra sound. It was raw, it was organic, it was real. And I love Slides, the ground he walked on. He was just, and so did Miles Davis. Miles Davis went to a Slide and Family Song concert and could not believe what he was seeing. Did you ever come close to meeting Sly? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, one, of the, one of the texts, when I first got with Slade, we had a tech that was already there working for them, and he had worked for Sly. And uh, I met Sly backstage at the Apollo. I went to see him at the Apollo. And he kept us waiting for three hours. I was in, I went with Raheem from GQ, the lead singer. I was working with GQ, the lead singer for GQ. And he and I went to the show and we stayed in our seats for three hours waiting for him. When he came out, he said, y'all didn't have no handcuffs attached to your seats. You could have left when you wanted to. But now we, and you know, that was also my, my, uh, I just wanted to be in the room. I don't care how long I had to wait. I didn't care how, what, I just wanted to be in the space to see the performances. And I'll tell you, Scott, I believe, truly believe that um, the funk music era is the most creative era for black music ever. Organic, they had nothing to sample from. They had nothing to sample from. So it was all organic, all straight from the heavens. And um, these performers went out and blew stages away. And um, this is the genre that's getting overlooked now by the Hall of Fame. Because I can, I can name 30 groups from the funk music era that should be Heat Wave, Cool in the Gang, Commodores. I was listening to um, the Brothers Johnson. I got a, I, I'm on Napster and I have a funk music playlist. Um, Slave. Now let's talk about Cami. Well, Ohio Players, not even. I, all, all of these groups should have been in Ruth, Rufus. Scott, I could, there are 30. It's I sent you my list. At least Rick James, yeah, it's you know, and now Richie's going in without the guys that he grew up with, you know, and that's what this industry does, you know. Um, so you know, um, I plan. I, I was trying to organize a boycott of the Hall of Fame. Diamond, I I, I talked to Lester. I talked to Diamond. I talked to Bootsy. I said, let's just go on, on one of their ceremonies. Let's go up there and bum rush the Hall of Fame like Will Smith did to the Grammys. And let's go right outside, call the news people and say, how come Heat Wave and Fatback and the Brothers Johnson, Commodores and Rufus featuring Shock and <clears throat> um, Cameo, come on. I worked for Larry Blackman. I was on the, I was, uh, on the Word Up tour. Mm. I was That's a the drum biggest, tech. biggest tour probably right there. And guess who was the drummer? Bruce Carter from the group Pleasure. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Big Bruce. Huh? He was mad. He was the bomb. He was, and I was his tech. And uh, Larry, Larry uh, Blackman actually sat with me at a sound check and had me on a snare drum for 45 minutes, teaching me the frequencies of a snare. And his thing was frequencies. You don't crisscross frequencies with instruments. 
Snare drum has its own space, different from a tom, different from a floor tom, different from a kick, different from, and he actually sat with me and taught me how to mix a snare drum. And then on the word up tour, we had electronic drums. So all of those snare sounds were, I had to change cart at the, behind the stage. I had to change a cart in between a, a little session and make sure. And I never missed, never missed a, a beat. Hmm. And uh, again, you know, I want to thank Larry Blackman and, uh, and um, uh, Aaron Mills. You know, they, they were my, you know, they were my go-to guys. And Aaron came out and said, hey, man, let me show you, you know, what we do in the studio with this and this. And, you know, I was just taking it all in. And, and uh, it's it's really a blessing when you love what you do. You know, you can't wait to get up and go do it. Let me ask you about a couple of these others, uh, Stuart. Uh, Fatback Band? Fatback Band. Bill Curtis, when I lived in Queens, New York. Bill Curtis is from Queens, New York. And uh, again, you know, I, I, I feel some, I feel to, I feel to remember how I first met these people, you know, but I was his driver. I drove his truck and took him around. We opened up on a tour. It was the emotions and the brothers Johnson and the Fatback Band. Nice. So there's Lewis and George, and I just couldn't wait to get the band, my band off the stage so I could get my shit in the truck. Let me go watch the Brothers Johnson. Please let me go see the Brothers Johnson. Oh, oh. You know, and um, again, you know, we did that tour. Uh, uh, Fatback had girls. I like the girls, and... Uh, Right. And actually, his keyboard player was from Heat Wave. Um, Jerry Thomas was one of the keyboard players. Jerry Thomas. And there was, a, yeah, Jerry Thomas was from Heat Wave. And he was in the fat back. Yeah. So again, you know, all of these groups are. When I got with Cameo, um, they needed a trump, uh, they needed a trombone player. And I called Frank from the Barcades. Frank and I, you know, cut buddies. Frank, and you listen, listen. You listen to the Bar case horns. You know, that again, you know, just horn section, you know, the art string ensembles were the instruments of the day, you know, and I just learned to listen to the natural sound of these instruments and then just boost up their volume in the house as much as I could. And uh, I got a, you know, I got a good feeling for music and a good head for that kind of, and I made sure the bass made you rumble from all the way back. Yeah. What so, about uh, Maze? Maze, um, another friend of mine, uh, you know, through for whatever osmosis they needed the drum tech hired me on the spot, went out to California, did rehearsals with Frankie and, uh, and um, let me see, and Michael White was playing the drums. He plays with George Benson now and does it. Michael White is probably got the first chair, union chair in LA now. He does commercials, TV shows. And um, yeah, so I spent four years with Frankie so in the 80s or when was that? Uh, 80s and 90s when um, Bug, Bug was still alive, McKinley was still alive, and Rome was the percussionist. And that, um, now when I was with Ashton and Simpson, I took uh, that percussionist out to New Jersey to LP, the LP Latin Percussion uh, Factory. Because uh, Ashford's percussionist, Sammy Figueroa, was getting an endorsement deal with LP. So they had me pick up their car from the city and drive out, drive Sammy out to Jersey and do this photo shoot. And Martin Cohen, 
He's still alive, still my friend. He was a, he was the uh, CEO and and founder of LP Music. He actually traveled the world in pursuit of percussion. He created the he created the kabasa. He created the vibra slap. So I went out to the studio to take pictures, and I had I actually. I up late. I didn't take a shower. My hair was all messed up. And I am doing this jump, this uh, warm up suit. Rushed out to Jersey. Martin Cohen says, "Oh, Stu, what do you do?" I said, "Well, I work for Roberta Flack, and I did the Ashford, and I've done, you know." Then he said, "Oh, you a professional roadie, huh?" I said, well, "I guess so." He said, "Go over there and take some pictures." hold this, do like this, did it? And he gave me an endorsement as a roadie for LP, Latin Percussion Music. Gave me a stack of pictures. I, I think I sent you the photo. Sent me a stack of pictures. Hey, man, you know, go out there and do your best. And here's some pictures I gave I gave pictures to all my friends. They put them on their refrigerators and everything, you know, and I didn't know what it meant, except I was just blessed to be in the space. Did you get to see Frankie Beverly just, you know, interact much or what kind of guy did he seem to be? He was him and his manager, Joe Douglas, uh, rest in peace, Joe, Joe, um, just passed away last year. Uh, Frankie, again, you know, um, the, all of these groups felt like their crews were family. I've been on Frankie's yacht in the Bay Area. When we went up for rehearsals and we had days off, he'd take everybody on the boat. Come to his house, you know, doo -doo -doo. let's go out on the boat. Okay. Took everybody on the boat. But again, you know, they, they, they were perfectionists. So, you know, he was, he, was, he, was, he was a rough guy, you know, but he knew what they wanted. I was with them for four years. Did the Essence, they, this is when they were closing the Essence Festival. They used to be the headliner, the last group at the Essence Festival for 10 years. Hmm. Uh, I was with them at the, um, at, in New Orleans at the Sanger Theater when they recorded their live album. And all of the crew, all of the group, we were all family. Most of the matter of fact, Rome used to ride on the crew bus. The Joe that you mentioned, the manager, was he the guy from Atlanta that mm -hmm. had the club? And mm -hmm. yep. yeah, I, I didn't know he had passed away. Yeah, he uh it's it, you know, actually, Scott, it's actually some uh some confusing circumstances because um there at the first report was that he took his own life. Hmm. But then it came out that he may have had some people that were super jealous or super whatever and shot him in his own driveway at his house. Hmm. Yeah, but Joe Douglas was, again, one of the best managers in the world. Uh, not greedy, charitable. Gave us bonuses, hit us off. Hey, man, hey, take this, take this, you know, hey, you know. And as long as you, so I set up for Michael White and I set up for whatever drummer came through at the time. There's much more to this great Truth and Rhythm interview. Just continue on to the next part of the episode. Also, be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. And become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinslift.net. Thank you very much.